It's episode 113 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show. This podcast provides the tools you need to create your own expression of a healthy ketogenic lifestyle so you can stop obsessing and start living. I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. Now, let's get on with the show. Let me take just a quick second here to tell you about another great offer coming from our friends over at ButcherBox. You all know by now that the quality of your meat matters so, so much to the health of your body, to your family's body, to your future health, the health and happiness of the animal you are consuming equals the health and happiness of your own body. That's really the simplest, easiest way to think about it. So you always want to make sure you can get the best quality meat for you and your family that you can afford. ButcherBox is the go-to source for the highest quality, best tasting meat sourced from these happy and healthy animals. And they've made it very affordable in order for you to get these meats delivered right to your door every single month. So you don't have to worry about sifting through the grocery store trying to find those meats that actually fit the bill. Because I can tell you from experience, it is becoming harder and harder to find these 100% grass fed, grass finished beef, the pasture raised chicken, the heritage breed pork. You just can't find that in grocery stores these days. You can get this all at ButcherBox because they are doing it right and sending it to your door so you don't have to worry about it. The summer promotion from ButcherBox is out. For the month of July, they are offering new members burgers all summer. That means if you sign up today, you get a free package of six burgers in every single box you get through October 15th. So you'll have fresh burgers with this awesome, amazing grass-fed, grass-finished beef all summer long, which I love burgers in the summer. What else would you possibly want to eat? It's the perfect time to grill those up. So head to butcherbox.com slash KFW to get your free burgers all summer. That's six free patties in every single box through the entire summer up until October 15th. Butcherbox.com slash KFW. Hey, hey, friends. Welcome back. Thanks, as always, for joining me on this episode of Keto for Women. Today, it's just me and you. And I have a topic that I'm actually surprised I haven't really talked about in detail yet here on the Keto for Women show in the past 113 episodes. But it's an important one and something that you all may or may not even be considering when it comes to your relationship with food, and that is fear. The fear that we are potentially associating with some of the foods out there that we're either consuming and maybe feeling guilt or shame when we do consume them or not consuming because we're that scared of them. So obviously... I think we all know that's probably not something that we want to carry around with us, but a lot of us don't even know that that's happening. And maybe you do, but you don't know how to get out of that mindset. And we're going to go over that today. Before we do that, just some really quick announcements. The first one is for those of you that are interested in doing the Fat Burning Female Project, we have our July class that is just finishing up with their last week. This week, they've been absolutely amazing. They've done great things. They've seen some great improvements just in the six weeks, and they have these tools to take on for their life. And now it's your turn. If that's something that you have yet to do and are interested, the last class of the year, 
all of 2019. And it may possibly be, I'm not going to hold myself to this one way or the other, but it might be my last class of teaching it live. Right now I'm in the Facebook group every day. I'm doing office hours twice a week, and I'm doing a live call in the middle of the course to answer any and all questions, make sure everyone has all the answers they need to get through it successfully. It may be the last time I do that. I'm not sure what 2020 will hold. It may be that I do still teach a few more classes of the Fat Burning Female Project. I don't know for sure. So if you want to make sure you are getting live help from me during your transition into a fat burning female, you will want to sign up for the October class. The enrollment for that will be the last week of September. I know we still got a little time. It's mid-August, but I mean, could these months go any quicker in this year. I don't even know how it's already August. So I just want to make sure I'm putting it out there because it will be there before you know it. And if you want to make sure you get into class, you have to enroll right away so that there is definitely a spot for you because we're going to do a little smaller group this time. Anyway, enough about that. We still have a few weeks before that comes into play. I'll remind you again, don't worry. What I do want to make sure that you know about right now is I've teased it many times. There are two things coming up in the very near future for you that are more in this mindset around your diet, your body, the food you're eating, and how to basically just live a better life, not having to be so stuck in this mindset. And it's something I've been through. It's something I've shared quite a bit here now on the podcast. And now I'm so passionate about helping you all get there too, because without changing your mindset around everything basically that you have going on in your life, you're going to stay stuck. You're absolutely going to hit a point where you cannot get any better, whether that's health wise, with your weight, with your marriage, with your job, money situations, all of it. It all comes together in the importance of the mindset and how you are approaching those things going on in your life. Anyway, two things coming up in the very near future from me to you. If you are interested in learning more about these mindset projects, there is an interest list. That is how you will get to know what's going on, then you can make the decision if it's something you want to be involved in or not. So in order to get all the details, you must be on this interest list. It is providing me with your email that only I will ever see and I will only ever email you about these mindset projects so that you have the best information and can decide for yourself if they are right for you. That's it. So if you would like to get emails from me about this stuff, head to seanminer.com slash mindset, and you can get on this VIP wait list so that you know what's coming up. Again, like I said, it's like a week away. So get on it ASAP. All right, that's it. Let's move on to today's hot topic, food fear. It's a real thing. I've been through it. I've been through so much of it, probably most of my life until now. And I'll be honest, and I'm going to go through my story here quickly too. I'm not totally over it, but I've come a long way. And I think a lot of you will relate to my story. My food fear growing up was around diet. I was afraid of fat. I was afraid of calories because I was afraid of getting fat or not losing weight. It had nothing to do with what those things were doing to my health or not doing for my health. It was all about not wanting to gain weight and or trying to lose weight. So fat fear, we all had it if you grew up in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. And calories were a real fear. And I think for a lot of you, they still are a very big fear because we've been fed pun intended. And we believe wholeheartedly that calories in versus calories out is a thing. And that in order to lose weight, you need to lower the energy you're putting into your body and expend more energy than what you are consuming. All that, trust me, I believed it for so, so long. I preached it. I hate to say it, but I preached it as a personal trainer because that's what we were taught in our like one chapter on nutrition. That's what we were taught. 
And so that's what I believed because that's what I was told. And I didn't do further research, which luckily now being older and wiser, I have done and I know the truth, which I've told you here many times on the show. But as I was growing up, that was the thing. That was my fear. And the interesting thing is, yes, I was afraid of calories. I was afraid of fat. I was afraid of fast foods, anything that would just lead to weight gain, according to them, quote unquote, they say I was afraid of. But then I would binge on it every weekend. I would be really great about my sticking to the plan on the weekdays, eating the foods that I wasn't afraid of, and then totally binge on the weekend, felt guilty about it, felt shameful about it, would go through this pattern over and over and over again. Then I got sick with my first autoimmune disease, 2008. I got sick, didn't know what to do, started doing the research and understanding that there could be foods that were triggering this autoimmune disease. And this was the first time that I started having food fears because of my health, which is still very real. It still feels very similar to being afraid of gaining weight. Now it's afraid of being sick. Very similar, yet of course, very different takes on a new tone. And that led me into this years of crazy train around my food, which I didn't know at the time. I thought I was doing the right thing for my body. And I think to some degree I was at the time because I had to get my health issues under control, but I let it get a little bit out of hand. So there was at one point, I don't know how many years into this it was, but I was eating under 10 foods. Those were the only foods that I could eat that I wasn't afraid of or that weren't reacting in me when I did eat them, they weren't causing this major bloat or my autoimmune disease to flare. It was very minimal. It was like chicken, ground beef, sweet potatoes, greens, avocado. I think that's about it (laughs) at one point. There wasn't much. And I just now realized that that wasn't a healthy place to be mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of it. Yes, it was a reaction that my body was giving me to these foods, but I now can see that there was also the component that I was bringing into having these fears, my headspace around these foods, my negativity around these foods and around the whole situation, which we're going to talk about here coming up. I now can see what I was doing was contributing to these foods not working for me instead of helping me. So I went through AIP, which is the autoimmune protocol. I did that. I've talked about this before. I did that for a year and then a few more months later down the road. And it was so isolating. It made me super depressed. I couldn't go out with my friends. I just stayed home. I was eating the same thing every day. And I was scared of foods that were not on the AIP protocol. I was scared to eat nuts and nut butters. I was scared to eat potatoes, peppers, chocolate, these foods that I eat every day and are totally fine. I got really scared of them. Eggs. That was one of the biggest things. I mean, we all, I think most of us eat quite a bit of eggs and they're super delicious, super nutritious. And I was scared of them. For a long time, I was scared to eat eggs. At one point, I dabbled in the GAPS protocol. I did SCD, all of these different, very restrictive healing diets. I was doing like all of them at one time. (laughs) And finally, I just hit rock bottom. I was eating very few foods that I felt comfortable eating. I had no social life. I wasn't really getting that much better. Like I kind of felt a little different, but not really. I was still not in remission from my autoimmune diseases. I was still getting bloated basically just by eating anything. It just wasn't worth it. And I finally hit rock bottom and gave up. I just said, whatever, I can't do this. I need to eat more foods. This isn't working. And that's when I started getting into feeling ill regardless because I was dealing with the mold illness, didn't know it at the time, found out soon after. And it was just like, I always feel bad, so I might as well just start eating what I want to eat. 
And, you know, fast forward a little bit longer and then I found keto. And when I found keto, there's this typical thing and it's becoming more and more prominent every single day. And when I started keto almost three years ago, it wasn't nearly as bad as what it is today since it's exploded so much in the past three years. There's this fear of carbs and sugar. And I know even if you guys don't want to admit it, if you are keto right now, or if you're trying to perhaps add in more carbohydrates because you've been keto and are trying to become more metabolically flexible or see what else is out there, you probably in that time that you were trying keto may have developed some fear around carbohydrates, around sugar, because there is a lot of information out there about what it can do to your body if you consume too many carbs, too much sugar, especially if you have some sort of blood sugar imbalance or other health issues you're working on. There's a lot of fear mongering around carbs. And of course, a lot of it is necessary. It, we need to know this information about what foods are doing to us or could potentially do it to us. It just comes with this fear attached or that we should be scared, that we should be avoiding as much as possible these otherwise healthy foods. It just, it's a lot. There's a lot of that going on. I didn't ever have that fear when I started keto because I didn't start it as something that would help me lose weight or that would be this crazy crash diet that I got on. I didn't have the diet mindset. I had basically lost that diet mindset when I got sick because suddenly I just wanted to feel better. I didn't really care about any sort of diet or anything else. I just wanted to get my life back and I think a lot of you can agree with me. It's hard to have a good, healthy, normal, abundant, fun, delicious, how many more words can I use, life when you have this crazy diet mindset. It's hard to manage both. And I just wanted that to be gone. Remember, I hit rock bottom after being on all these different healing protocols, which were really just super strict diets. I just gave up. I just didn't want anything to do with that anymore. So I found keto on this whole different plane. I was using my intuition. It drove me naturally to eat lower carb foods and higher fat foods because that is what was healing my body. That's what was making me able to get through the day and to get out of bed and to go to work and do everything that I was doing because I was keto. It was just fueling my intuition to want more of that. So I naturally went towards these other foods, these higher fat foods, more keto friendly in air quotes foods than the high carbohydrate foods. I also never went zero carb. I never tried to do that. I never went zero fruit. I never went zero sweet potatoes. I always kept my favorite foods in, but I was just driven to them less and that provided me with a very healthy, intuitive keto lifestyle, which I've talked about pretty much every episode here. But I wanted to kind of give the backstory on how I got there from having been at these places of just like pure dieting, craziness. All I was thinking about was food. All I was caring about was food. It was an obsession. And basically how many foods I couldn't have became an obsession. Fast forward to now, which has been almost three years since I started keto and probably a little less than a year that I haven't been in ketosis regularly. And I intuitively knew to start adding in more carbohydrates that I didn't need to be in ketosis at all times to continue my health trend. I felt good in ketosis, I felt good out of ketosis. I felt good eating more carbs, eating more sugar. And that's how I knew that it was time to branch out and move on. And it came very naturally to me. I think also not having that fear around carbohydrates helped because I wasn't scared to start adding more sweet potatoes, more plantains, more fruit, desserts, basically whatever I wanted. It just came naturally. And it was because my body was driving me, was leading me to
to those foods. Those foods started sounding really good. Those foods started having this concept of more energy. <laughs> like, I wish I could explain it a little better. If you eat intuitively, then you know what I mean. It's like you start seeing those foods and you're like, that food would give me so much energy. My workout would feel better or this hike I'm on would be that much better if I ate that banana. It's really weird, but it's true. You'll know when you get there, this intuitive eating that happens. But there are still foods that I avoid because of how I know they make me feel or the repercussions that would be involved with my health if I consumed them. Again, my intuition knows that, makes me not really want them. And as my health has progressed and my major health issues have gotten further and further behind me, more and more foods have gotten into this equation. All right, so let's get into how this episode came to be and what I really want you to get from this episode. If this is the one thing you grasp from this episode, let it be this piece of information here. I listened to an episode of the Oprah, I think it's Super Soul Sundays or something like that. It's a podcast, Soul Talk. I can't remember what it's called right now. Anyway, it's an Oprah show and it was just her talking about actually her weight loss journey and these fluctuations we pretty much all know she's had at this point. She's made it very open and clear about her losing weight and gaining weight. I'll actually link to the episode in the show notes of this. It's also going to be quote unquote homework in one of my upcoming projects because it's that important and really has that big of a message. But I'm going to share kind of the gist of it right here, right now, in case you don't have time to listen to it. The main topic was talking about the ego versus the intuition. The ego coming from a place of fear and our intuition coming from a place of love, gentle knowing, and peace. She related this conversation, these two things to her weight gain and weight loss. I today want to relate them to your food choices. And I think it also is very pertinent to weight gain and weight loss if this is something that I'm going to be teaching very closely coming up soon. You're just getting more and more little snippets, little previews of what's coming up. But this is all coming. But today I want to talk about it as it relates to our conversation around food. So our ego When we are scared of food, it's our ego taking over and making us believe that that food is quote unquote bad, it may be off limits, it's going to cause harm to you, it's going to make you gain weight, it's going to keep you from losing weight, it's not allowed. And if you eat it, it means you're a bad person, it means you've fallen off the wagon, it means you should feel guilty, it means you're not following the proper diet. Here's a big one. It means you'll get out of ketosis. This one food, this one bite of this one food is going to get you out of ketosis. All of these stories, you can see they are stories. They come from a place of fear. So this is how you know. It's a very easy way to know what's talking in you. Is it your ego or is it your intuition? Is it coming from a place of fear like the the little devil on your shoulder, or is it coming from a place of peace, love, and gentleness, like gentle knowing? Think about that for a minute. Gentle knowing. That is such a powerful thought to have and a powerful place to be. So you can see then that when it's your intuition, it's more of a guidance system. There is no can and can't. There is no fear. There is no guilt, shame, no negative thoughts, emotions, feelings whatsoever, or any sort of tags or labels of your foods. So now that we know that we have the ego and the intuition, now we can see that when we have a food fear or we feel guilty or shameful around the foods that we binge on or are trying not to eat, but then we do how that 
plays out from your ego's perspective. So why do we fear foods? Let's go over some of the reasons why we even have this in the first place. We fear food because of the belief that body weight can and should be manipulated with food, right? We all kind of have had that sewn into our beliefs at some point, and it's a hard one to shake. It's a hard one to let go of the idea, your ego telling you that you can manipulate the size and shape of your body by your food choices. We've been told that for how many years? It's something we believed for most of our lives, yet it doesn't work. It does not work. It has never worked. It never will work. Dieting, controlling, restricting, yeah, it may work for the short term. It does not work long term. In fact, it will do the opposite. In almost all cases, it does the opposite and causes weight to be gained right back your size to come right back, if not even more so. And there are studies upon studies upon studies that show this, more and more coming out every day. But anyway, that's probably one of the main reasons why we fear food, why our ego has put that fear-based thought into your head. You also may fear food because you're afraid you might lose control with your food or with a certain food. You may fear let's say cookies, because you have no control over cookies. Once you start eating them, you just want all of them. You have no control over that food. So you're scared to even try because you'll spiral out of control, or at least your ego is telling you that you will. And your ego has led you to do that in the past. You may fear food because you fear death, you fear disease, you fear illness, or you may fear a reoccurrence of an illness or a disease that you have had in the past. And even worse, if you took out some foods and it made that illness or disease get better, and now you fear that even looking at those foods is going to make you feel sick again, or get you back into that state of illness or disease. And that's kind of where I came from for a long time. And to be honest, I still feel that way, particularly with gluten. I eliminated gluten when I got my first autoimmune disease. And since then have heard nothing but how bad it is for you and how bad it is for your gut and will cause autoimmune diseases to flare up, specifically Hashimoto's, which is my second autoimmune disease. So now I do still have a fear of eating gluten. And I personally, I don't know if that's true for my body. I don't know if it's still true with the amount of healing I've done, but I do still have a little bit of that fear. And I think it's something eventually I'm going to have to get over because pizza would be kind of nice every once in a while. And gluten-free pizza just isn't the same. But really, I have very little desire for anything that contains gluten besides like that pizza that just looks really good sometimes. So I'm not super concerned about that. But I can totally relate to you if you are someone that fears the reoccurrence of an illness when you have eliminated it and it did help. And then you've since heard how bad it is for you and for that disease in particular. Anyway, another place where your ego is butting into your life is when this is all keto specific. I find a lot of ego in the keto community right now, and it kind of drives me crazy. When you fear you're not doing the diet, which is keto, it could be really any diet, anything, even counting calories, counting macros, whatever it is that you're doing, you fear not doing it perfectly. So you're fearing foods that would make it not keto or not whatever diet you're doing. It could be with keto that you fear not getting into or staying in ketosis. If you eat a certain food, eating too many carbs, eating too much food, not fasting when you're supposed to be fasting, getting out of ketosis. This is a big one I see. It's like once people get into ketosis and see that reading on their meter, they're so scared. 
to get back out. They're so scared to eat anything differently than what they ate that day that got them into ketosis. They're like, if I just keep eating this exact thing, I'll stay keto. And so they fear adding more carbs or doing really anything different. And of course, that's an ego thing. That's your ego telling you, you have to stay in ketosis all the time or else bad things are going to happen. You have to get into ketosis and that requires a certain amount of carbs, all that stuff. Now, you could fear of falling off track if you don't have restriction. You could think or your ego could tell you that you're the kind of person that needs rules and restrictions and to follow everything perfectly in order to stay, quote unquote, on track. What track are we on? Nobody knows, but you could fear falling off the wagon or off track if you don't have those rules in place. So then therefore, those rules lead to foods that you are avoiding out of fear because they're not on the rules. And lastly, I'm sure there's many more reasons we fear food, but the big ones that stick out for me, I guess, fear of feeling like crap. (laughs) And this is a big one that I definitely relate to. And I really think this is more of an intuitive sense. This is where your intuition taps in and makes you avoid foods because you know it's going to make you feel like crap. That's the intuitive sense coming in. And again, it's a gentle knowingness. It's not like, oh God, if I eat that food, I'm going to feel terrible. It's just knowing like, I don't want that because I want to feel good. But if you fear feeling like crap because someone else ate it and it made them feel like crap or someone told you not to eat this or you'll feel like crap, again, those would be fear-based thoughts coming from the ego. Before we get deeper into this episode, I want to talk to all you ladies out there with high blood sugar levels, which I know is quite a few of you. We have a special VIP offer for all of our Keto for Women listeners from our partners over at Herbally, an organic wellness tea that supports healthy blood sugar levels. Did you know that there's actually an herbal tea that can help you take control of your blood sugar? All you need is one cup a day to start feeling its benefits. Herbally is full of ingredients that are scientifically proven to lower your blood sugar and improve your overall health. Here are some of the health benefits you can expect when you drink herbally. Stable blood sugar levels, reduced sugar cravings, and improved digestion, increased energy levels, and a boost to your immune system. Sounds pretty great to me. Herbally Wellness Tea has a countless of five-star reviews, including this one from Linda M. I was dubious when I bought Herbally Tea as I've seen so many products claiming to help regulate glucose levels. I've only been using this for a few days, but I've seen lower fasting levels. I enjoy a nice relaxing cup of tea in the evening, and I love the flavor. I'll continue to use this product. There's also one from Janet K who says that after just a few days, her husband started drinking this tea and his blood sugar levels were at the lowest ever. So it's good for your partners too. Herbally is jam-packed with a blend of eight natural ingredients, including ginger, turmeric, and lavender petals, to name just a few. These herbs have been used and proven in holistic medicine for centuries, which means Herbally's blend is 100% Sean approved. I love the holistic medicine approach for sure. No added sugar or artificial sweeteners either, another Sean approved item, but you'll be surprised at how naturally sweet and delicious this stuff tastes. We promise you will be going back for more. Best of all, you can enjoy a bag of Herbaly 100% risk-free with their 60-day money-back guarantee. Visit bloodsugar22.com and use the code bloodsugar22 to get 15% off your first order. Again, that's bloodsugar 22 Dot com and use the coupon code bloodsugar22 to get that 15% off your order plus their risk-free 60-day money-back guarantee. Thank you to Herbaly for sponsoring this episode of the Keto for Women show and helping bring the episode to air. Now, where did these fears come from? 
obviously we're talking ego versus intuition now. I think we're all getting a sense of what that means in ourselves and what thoughts are coming from our ego versus what thoughts are coming from our intuition. And please don't feel bad if you don't know if any thoughts have come from your intuition lately. That is a kind of a muscle that requires some building and some practicing, especially if you've let your ego take over for so long, which is quite common, totally normal. I get it. I was there. It does take some time for you to understand and realize your intuition is talking. But anyway... That's not what we're talking about today. We have these two things. So what's feeding your ego that is giving you these thoughts and fears? Someone told you something, you read something, you heard something, you're in a Facebook group that says something, you follow someone on Instagram that told you something, you are getting all of this from outside sources. This is huge huge, 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 especially if you are deep in the keto space, you are getting fueled all over the place with information that is not about you. (laughs) It's information about other people, what they did, what they think, what they found. It's not you. And that is a constant in the keto space right now. And your ego is soaking it all up and trying to get you to believe it. You were possibly taught from a very young age or as you grew up or even just a few years ago, whatever it is, what foods were good and bad, healthy and unhealthy, on and off the plan, all this stuff. And it's either something, again, you were taught or you kind of picked up along the way a lot of times from media or some diet program that you did years ago, you still have those things lingering around. Even if it was from like Weight Watchers 30 years ago or something, you're still holding on to some of those beliefs. Your ego, I guess I should say, is still holding on to some of that. You have fully bought into the diet industry rhetoric says you have to control your food to lose weight. Again, haven't we all at some point, aren't we all now or some of us at least hopefully trying to climb out of that and trying to reverse out of that, I guess, is a better way in that belief system. Again, that's something your ego soaked right up and is now using to your disadvantage when you have these thoughts and it's creating a lot of fear around food. And not only that, not just fear, obviously the guilt, the shame, the uncontrollableness around food, all this stuff, all this negative emotion around our food choices. You believe based on media that skinny is the only way to be. Ugh, I hate this. I hate this so much, but that's what we're fed. I mean, how do we not think that. And I'm so grateful that there are more companies getting involved with kind of a health at every size movement, showing their clothing, their bras, their bathing suits, all this stuff on different models of all shapes and sizes, because that is truly how we are. And that's truly how we're meant to be. Skinny is not the only way to be. Skinny is not the only healthy way to be. There are many skinny people who are unhealthy, many larger people that are healthy. It is just a society filled with diversity, and we are not seeing that. We are seeing only what we are supposed to want to be, which let's talk about that. We know this, but let me just make sure you fully know this. That is being fueled by the diet industry who wants you to continue to feel that need to look that way because then you will continue to spend money and you will continue to fuel this like 70, I already forgot the number and I just looked it up, $75 billion industry or something like that. Huge, huge industry. You will continue to provide that kind of money to this industry if you continue to think that you need to look a certain way and it's an unattainable goal. So there we go. Our whole life will be spent trying to reach this goal that's not attainable and they continue to make a bunch of money. And then lastly, specific to our keto peeps here, you believe that keto or whatever diet, insert whatever you diet you want there, is the only way to eat. Now, we all know that's not actually true, but I think a lot of us, again, we get really deep into that keto community, that keto space where there are people that fully believe that 
and judge people who don't eat keto and try to get everybody to eat keto. Like that judgment, like all that has to stop. But again, getting into a different tangent for a different day. Somewhere along the way in your keto journey, you were fed and your ego believes now that it's the only way to eat. And so then obviously anything that's not quote unquote keto friendly is off limits and not good. Nobody should be eating it bad. Like if I hear one more person tell me that carrots aren't keto, I'm going to freak out. But if you believe that, that's fear. That's your ego providing a sense of fear towards a particular food. And that is not okay. So you can see from that list that all of those things are thoughts that you think. So when we think about our intuition as being gentle knowing, none of that applies, right? Because those are all thoughts that have been fed to us from outside sources, not information that we've learned about from ourselves, which is something you know I totally encourage you to do and have always encouraged you to do here on the Keto for Women show. Let's move on to what this type of thinking does, because some of you may be like, yeah, I understand that my ego is taking over, determining what I do and don't eat and how I feel about food. It's creating these food rules that really shouldn't exist, but I don't really care. I still want to do it, which is fine. But let me at least inform you of what that is doing in your body, which may or may not make you change your mind about how you approach food. Understand that negative emotions around food cause stress. How many times have we talked about the impact of stress on our female bodies? We have got to do whatever we can to reduce the amount of stress we are under. And negative emotions around your food will cause stress. So when you are under stress, just by thinking, oh, I shouldn't be eating this food or this food doesn't work for me or this food isn't keto or this food is going to cause a major X, Y, Z in my body, when you think that, it causes stress. Even if you aren't actually eating that food, but even if you see it on someone else's plate or whatever, and you automatically think that negative emotion around that food, no matter what, that stress causes a lowered tolerance to that food. And this is very interesting, and there's actually several studies that show this. When you have a negative emotion around food, if, say, you're eating that food with this sense of fear about not knowing what it's going to do to you or feeling guilty when you're eating it, you actually have an inability to absorb the nutrients in that food. I think it was like a 40 or 60% less absorption of the nutrients in that food. So even if it's something like carrots and someone has told you, well, like many people at this point in the keto community has told you, carrots aren't keto, you cannot eat this food and stay in ketosis or consider yourself keto in air quotes, then you have some carrots on your plate at a restaurant and you want to eat them, your ego takes over, you eat them, but you're having these crazy thoughts in your head about carrots not being keto, you will not absorb the same amount of nutrients if you just ate the carrots, loved every minute, let your intuition guide you. It's fascinating information, but that is very true. Also, when you have a sense of fear around food, guilt, shame, any other negative emotion that you feel around food, it leads to a spiral. You spiral out of control and you then become even more detached from that food, that experience, your body and how it feels, your hunger versus satiety cues, and you overeat, you binge, and you feel like crap. And this is something that often comes about when you do decide that cookies are off limits and you cannot eat them. If you eat them, you are a bad person. You're not following the plan. You fell off the wagon. You're going to have to start over. You're terrible at dieting. Nothing will ever work. I mean, how many stories can we make up around a cookie? But If you have this feeling and then you see the cookies and your ego takes over and you know you shouldn't be eating them, and again, this is your ego talking, you shouldn't be eating them, they're going to do bad things, they're going to totally ruin your diet, you're never going to lose weight, you eat them and you can't stop eating them because you have completely disassociated from yourself and the experience and your body. So instead of eating one cookie, 
you eat seven or the whole bag or whatever. And you feel obviously probably not very good after eating that much. And it affects you as a person, which is going to lead into the next thing that happens with you when you have these negative emotions around food, which is you take the label of the food and put it onto yourself. So if you have these negative emotions about the cookie, then when you eat the cookie and overeat the cookies, then that leads to how you feel as a person. You become a bad person. You become a bad dieter. You become unworthy of losing weight. You have this lowered self-esteem, this lowered confidence. You lower your vibration, which is something we're going to talk about. Your energy, your spirit, your worthiness. You as a person, you've now tacked that onto yourself or your ego has tacked that onto yourself. So that affects you emotionally and mentally way more than just eating a couple cookies would if you would have not had that association with the food, that negative association attached to that food. Of course, looking a little bit deeper into this, it can lead to serious health conditions and consequences. And I'm talking specifically about eating disorders. And again, if you are someone that thinks you may have the symptoms of an eating disorder, especially after I read a little bit more about one in particular, that's not technically known as an eating disorder just yet, but is well on its way to becoming one, which is orthorexia. If after hearing this information in this episode, you feel like that may be something going on for you, please get help, learn more. You can do so by calling the Eating Disorder Helpline at 1-800-931-2237. That is the National Eating Disorders Association Helpline. They will be happy to help you. This is not something to take lightly. All right. I want to talk about orthorexia specifically today. I've mentioned it on several episodes of the Keto for Women show in the past, but I want to give a little bit more context here because I think this is a really good time and a really good episode to bring it up because we're talking about being scared of food and having this negative emotion attached to food. And when it comes to the keto community, a lot of times that fear becomes an obsession and especially an obsession with healthy foods and being as healthy as possible. And that's what orthorexia really involves. It's a term started in 1998 and is now being considered a form of eating disorder. It's when eating healthy becomes an unhealthy obsession. So it affects your health and well-being. Of course, there's nothing wrong with wanting to eat healthy in and of itself. It's when it's taken to the extreme and becomes an obsession. And I hate to say it, but I, I see this quite a bit. And to be perfectly honest, I think I was on my way there too. And luckily I caught myself in the nick of time before it got to be even worse than it had gotten back when I was really sick and I got out of it. But Let's go through some of the warning signs and symptoms of orthorexia. Compulsive checking of ingredient lists and nutritional labels, an increase in concern about the health of ingredients, cutting out an increasing number of food groups like all sugar, all carbs, all dairy, all meat, all animal products, an inability to eat anything but a narrow group of foods that are deemed healthy or pure, unusual interest in the health of what others are eating, spending hours per day thinking about what food might be served at upcoming events, showing high levels of distress when safe or healthy foods aren't available, obsessive following of food and healthy lifestyle blogs on Twitter and Instagram, body image concerns may or may not be present. And that's again coming from the National Eating Disorder Organization. It seems like something in reading that list that has a fine line between being healthy and being unhealthy and making good choices and choosing the highest quality foods when they're available and being really interested in eating healthy food and the benefits that that brings to then becoming obsessed with it. And I can see a lot of people now, even in the past few years that I've known that would fall into those categories. And again, like I said, I think I was really close. I think I got out of it just in time before it did become a problem. And I'm grateful for that. But if that sounds like something where that could be you too, either now, or you could see yourself getting to that point, 
this is a really good episode for you to take to heart. And again, please get help from a professional if you think this is something that's going on for you. A few things that I want to kind of spotlight on that list. First of all, the judgment of others and their food choices. That cannot happen, should not happen. It is not for you to judge or to really have any emotion about what others are doing. We are all on our own journey. And the second thing is the inability to enjoy unhealthy foods because you think about how bad you're being and it's just all about the nutrition and what your food is or is not doing for your body. Of course, we as Keto for Women listeners enjoy eating healthy and learning what foods do and don't work for our body and feeling as good as we can and using a food as a catalyst to do so. But knowing or wanting that to be 100% of the time isn't realistic. It's not real life. It's not how we should be living life. And when it becomes an obsession to be 100% there all the time, that's when I think it could be getting into an unhealthy place and potentially a serious health condition with consequences. So keep that in mind. Please seek out professional help if that is you. All right, the last thing we're going to go through today, we have seven ways to help you get over your negative thoughts around food. Now we've gone through what those negative thoughts look like, where they're coming from, what part of your brain is sending you these messages, which is your ego, and how we can start getting our intuition back in the game. That's what we'll go over here. And now with these seven tips. Number one, remind yourself of your bigger why and how you want to get there. So what's your reason for going keto or eating healthier or whatever diet you're doing, however you want to eat? What's your bigger why? You cannot come from a place of wanting to change, manipulate, or fix your body. That will immediately take your intuition out of the equation. You cannot eat intuitively and want to manipulate the size of your body with food, aka dieting. Can't do both. So if you have your sight set on a bigger why, which does not involve anything to do with how you look, it will help you and help your intuition come through. And also, not only that bigger why, which I've gone over many times, there's a bunch of different reasons. For me, back when I started keto, it was to get my life back. Now, my bigger why is to be 100% happy at all times, like full enjoyment of life. Like I, that's all I want. And I need to feel good in order to fully enjoy life. I need to have energy. I need to have mental clarity. I need to sleep well. I need my hormones to be in check, right? So health is a big piece of that. But I just want to just full on life enjoyment for the rest of my time here on this earth. That's my bigger why, which means I can do that in any body shape. My body can change and I can still have full on enjoyment. Of course, a big piece of my full enjoyment of life is working out and hiking and being super active. It's one of my favorite things to do is to get out in nature or to go to the gym and lift heavy things. So I need a body that is strong and capable and healthy enough to do so. But whatever package that comes in and as it changes throughout the years, which it's going to, I'm cool with that at this point. Also remember that it needs to come from a place of love, respect, care, and the desire to appropriately fuel your life. It cannot come with this negative emotion. So not only do you need to understand and remember your bigger why, but how you want to get there, which is coming from a place of love, respect, care, all that good stuff, not out of fear not out of hate, manipulation, none of that. Number two, get rid of the macros that you must hit or the rules you must follow. If you are still listening to the Keto for Women show and you're still tracking with an app, your carbs, your calories, how long you fasted, using all these apps, they are disconnecting you from your intuition and taking you further and further away from ever being able to reconnect with that. 
If you're still doing that, please, please, please consider getting off of that. If you need help, the Fat Burning Female Project would be great for you in order to take you. It's the perfect bridge to go from diet master to intuition master with your food. It takes you out of that diet mentality. It bridges the gap between needing to track your food and macros and calories and all that stuff to intuitive sense. So that would be great for someone like that who is still using those apps or even just writing down your food. That used to be me. I didn't have apps back in the day. So I used a little journal and wrote down my food every single day. So even if you think that tracking macros and your food is coming from a healthy place, it's not. It's not a healthy place to be in mentally. It can very easily lead to obsession. And that's something obviously we want to try to stay away from. And again, pure disconnection from your intuition. Your ego has absolutely taken over. Number three, know that perfection does not exist and is not required. Perfection is not going to happen. That's not life. That's not how we want to live our life. When you try to be perfect with your food, again, we lead to obsession. We lead to negative emotion because it's not going to happen. So eventually you're going to not be perfect and then you're going to feel poorly about yourself and your food choices. So you just don't always have to make the healthiest choice. And really you shouldn't because your intuition isn't always going to guide you to the absolute healthiest choice. It's going to also guide you to a place of pleasure and satisfaction and enjoyment. And sometimes that might be the cookie or the piece of cake at the wedding or the birthday party, but it's not going to be the whole cake. It's not going to be all the cookies. When you lead with your intuition, it's just enough to give you that sense of enjoyment and fulfillment and pleasure. That's it, which is really nice. Number four, remember that food is fuel for your body. Some fuel is better than others, but none are bad or are going to immediately damage you. Not one bite, not one piece, not one meal, not one day, not even one week, probably not even one month is going to permanently damage you. So I give the example of gasoline in your car. You can put unleaded gasoline in your car, which is the cheapest version that there is, that unleaded gas in your car. You can put mid-grade or you can put premium. At least that's the case in the US. I think that's different in other parts of the world or maybe even other parts of the country. I don't know. But here in Colorado, we have all three versions, unleaded, mid-grade, premium. If you normally put premium or even mid-grade in your car, and then occasionally you end up putting in unleaded, it doesn't mean your car is going to break down tomorrow. Yes, it's not as high quality. It's a little quote unquote dirtier. I don't know what what actually is the difference, but I do know that it can muddy up your engine over time, but it's not going to do that if every few months you put in some unleaded gas. I do this myself. My current car requires premium gas, but sometimes I just forget. I'm an autopilot. Back before I got my new car, I always put unleaded in my old car, which is probably why I didn't do so well at the end there. And so occasionally I'm just in autopilot and I put unleaded in a car that requires premium and it's fine. It's still totally fine. It runs great. Everything is wonderful. No big deal. Same thing goes for your body. Number five, think about the impact energy plays into this relationship. Now, I'm not talking about energy as in calories. I'm talking about your vibrational energy. And this is something I strongly, strongly agree with and believe in. I've seen it happen in my life so many times and in so many other people's lives. Your vibrational energy, knowing that positive thoughts puts you in a high vibrational place like actual science. We are all just balls of energy vibrating at specific frequencies. Your frequency will increase with positive emotions and thoughts and beliefs and will decrease with negative emotions. And not only that, but the law of attraction states that like attracts like, which applies to energy and our vibration. So if you are in a high vibrational place, you will continue to attract high vibes or positive vibes. If you are in a low vibrational place, you will attract low vibes or negative things that happen to you. So keep in mind how that can play out 
with your food choices and with your thoughts around food and your energy around food, what you're putting out there. And I really think that this is why when I was sick, I had just, I was overall negative around food. I didn't know what I could eat. I pretty much assumed that everything I ate was going to react in my body and was going to make me feel like crap. So every time I ate, that's what happened. I was in a very negative place, a low vibe place. So that is why I continued to react to foods and I continued to have to take foods out of my life. Whereas once I was just over it, I was like, whatever, I don't care. I'm just going to eat. I'm done with this. Then I was just kind of neutral. I had let go of this negative emotion and suddenly I could eat eggs, I could eat nuts, I could eat chocolate and I was fine. So I really think that we're not putting enough thought into the energy that we are feeling around food and how that will continue to attract the same like energy. So keep in mind, we'll talk about that more in the future. That's a very simple, easy way to describe it when I could go on for hours and hours about that, but it's important to consider. Number six, we have two more. Number six, trust your own internal guidance and body's signals instead of outside influence. Of course, we know this, but it's just hard. It's just really hard to do. And especially with the keto community and all of the information coming out and all the do's and don'ts and the rules and all that stuff, it's just impossible, it seems. But you've got to remember that your own internal guidance system is there. Your body's signals are there. You just have to choose to go by that and tune out this outside influence that does not know you, is not you. And that will calm down your ego. Your ego is absorbing that outside influence. Your intuition is not. If you decide to not let that get to you, you can tone down the ego's talk so that this internal guidance can come out, your intuition. And when you're in this process, I know it's hard, but There are some things to remember. First of all, a lot of what you're being told about food could be outdated or could be misinformation, especially if it's coming from a doctor that hasn't studied nutrition in a while or ever, (laughs) or a dietitian that doesn't know the updated information or was taught by the Food and Drug Administration, the government. That's all misinformation that's led by different industries, the agricultural industry, for example, or even just people that are citing studies that are 20, 30, 50 years old. The nutrition study industry is lagging. And so things that are coming out in studies, we're now already disproving. Like they came out yesterday and today we disproved it. So take all of it with a grain of salt and know that it could be outdated or misinformed. So that's where doing your own research on your own body will always be the best. This is an example where eggs, we thought they were bad, raise your cholesterol, now we think they're good. Butter used to be bad, now it's good. Fat, really in general, it used to be bad, now it's good. Sugar substitutes used to be great, now they're not so great, right? So it's like, how do we even know? What do we even do at this point? Except listen to your own internal guidance system, which you've got to zone out when it comes to outside influences and tap in when it comes to your internal influence. And then lastly, work on your mindset and your feelings about yourself and your body. Work on your acceptance, work on your worthiness, work on your confidence. I mean, all of it. We all just need to work on all of it. And that will help so much. It is an integral part of your health journey. Whether you are even dealing with food issues or not, if you haven't done the mental work you're going to be stuck. And I talked about that at the beginning. I'm talking about it now at the end because I want you to be involved 100% in your mindset. And that's why we'll be talking about it a lot more coming up. I'll be offering new projects that I hope you get involved in. It has to come as part of the journey. It has to be there. If it's not there yet, or if it's something you're trying to do and you want some extra guidance, Make sure you go sign up at seanminer.com slash mindset to get more information and we'll do that together. I'd be happy to help you, but it's got to be there. All right. That's it, friends. I hope I have given you some tools, even just some things to think about right now. We're all going to be on different paths, so we're all going to be ready or not ready at different times to take in this information and to put it into practice, but I do hope 
that it has at least given you something to think about. As always, with the Keto Woman Show and all these topics I bring to you, just want you to start thinking about it. That will do it for this episode. Have a good week, everyone, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye.